the vaccine news gave us confidence and gave the market confidence, as you've seen, that there is hope uh, for next year and we will see demand slowly recovering. And I think that's what the market is pricing in right now. Um, early doors, though, isn't it, Daniel, at this point, uh, given how far away we seem to be from a, a, con- a confirmed process for managing the vaccine and for getting passengers safely between destinations? That is definitely true, and I can only echo uh, Alexandra's comments um, that we need a better process uh, in terms of health and safety and what we're going to do and how we're going to combine vaccines, testing, um, and health and safety protocols. Um, and quite honestly, to add you know, to the worries, we're going into the kind of difficult winter months for airlines. Uh, and so there, there still is you know, a, little bit of, uh, uh, a little bit of tunnel left we have to go through until we get to the light. Uh, Daniel, how strong a line do you expect some of the airlines to take around the vaccine? And we've heard from Qantas already, the CEO is saying that he wants all passengers, it'll be non-negotiable, they must have a vaccine before they travel on the airline. Do you think that'll be a widespread view across the industry, given those health and safety issues and potential lawsuits from workers if they do contract the virus? I certainly hope so, Karen, that the industry finds a common voice. And that will be one of the big, uh, big challenges for Willie now stepping up to be the Director General of IATA to really make sure that global airlines apply common standards. But because I only think that if airlines on a global level are able to speak with one, one voice, only then will governments get the confidence to start removing some of those travel restrictions and quarantines. Daniel, can I be brutal here? Some airlines do not deserve to survive. We know this as well. Some of them, their business models and their debt structure are appalling as well. Let's not even go into the fact that some of them are subsidised by government de facto because they're shareholding. But are we going to see a better model for a broader European airline industry going forward? Or is it going to be the same old problem, overcapacity at the top uh, and indeed hand wringing at the bottom when the debts get too much? I'm afraid I have to say it'll be the same same cycle all over again. We'll see a little bit of capacity restraint in the next couple of years, simply because the debt level at many of these airlines are so high. Once that debt level recedes, we'll see everybody pushing capacity again. I'm afraid this crisis has simply been too large to really affect a change in the market structure. Daniel, um, who then comes out of this better and who would you recommend we look at more closely? Because we, we know the budget carriers are adept at keeping a close eye on the bottom line, but are they necessarily the ones who will come through with the strongest balance sheets? The answer is yes. I think there are three groups in the European market right now. You can look at Ryanair and Wiz, for example, with great liquidity resources to survive a long time and very low debt levels that will come in. And you've got kind of in the middle EasyJet and IAG who may need to go for another capital raise. And then you've got Lufthansa and our friends who will definitely need to go for a capital raise. And in that situation, what will happen is that many airlines in Europe will not grow by a lot, may even shrink over the next couple of years. But Ryanair and Wiz will use this to gain market share. And so that's, I really think, and you know, we've talked about this before, saying leisure will recover before business travel, short haul travel will recover before long haul travel. And that means Wiz and Ryanair are ideally positioned to have a very good few years in the next three to four years.